Welcome to yet another episode of WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm Corey, your host, and this is the episode for the week starting June 4th, 2012. So this was quite a busy and interesting week for network and information security news. Let's start with some updates to the flame malware I mentioned last week. If you remember last week, I talked about a new advanced persistent threat called the flame worm. This new piece of malware seems to target organizations in the Middle East, primarily in Iran, and is quite a large piece of malware that has many modules and seems to use advanced techniques to infect its victims and hide on the network and steal a lot of information from those victims. This week, AV researchers released some new analysis on the flame worm, including one piece of information that's very, very important to Microsoft Windows users out there. According to the update, Flame leverages a previously undisclosed or unrecognized issue in Windows's terminal server licensing service. Among other things, the terminal server licensing service ships with the ability to allow administrators to create cryptographic certificates they can use to sign code and make it seem like that code comes from Microsoft and is thereby trusted. Unfortunately, researchers found that Flame leverages a flaw with this certificate creation component specifically something called a cryptographic collision flaw. Essentially, Flame can do this man-in-the-middle attack. If it gets on your local network and infects a machine, it can then uh, launch a man-in-the-middle attack against any other machines that are looking for Windows updates. And by leveraging this uh, collision attack on, on these digital certificate creation, it can actually create certificates that look like they come from Microsoft themselves. Uh, the worm or the infected victim will then push fake updates to the other computers in your network that look as though they're really Windows updates signed with a trusted Microsoft key. The good news is, over the weekend, Microsoft released a security advisory, a bunch of blog posts, and even a Microsoft Windows patch that will help you fix this issue. The Windows patch actually revokes some certificates associated with this uh, terminal server licensing uh, service. Uh, in other words, it makes it so your Windows computers will no longer trust these potentially rogue certificates which Flame uses. Uh, Microsoft is also making other changes to make sure that other attackers cannot leverage this collision flaw to create more rogue certificates. But in any case, this is a very interesting new mechanism for malware to spread within local networks and is a good example of why Flame is considered an advanced threat or even an advanced persistent threat. The second Flame update has to do with its age. Previously, Kaspersky released information saying they believe Flame probably was originally created around March of 2010. However, this week, Kaspersky and some other botnet researchers actually started researching the command and control channels or domains associated with the flameworm. They found, I think, approximately 85 or 87 different command and control domains built within the flameworm. But more interestingly, some of those domains had been registered way back in March 2008, which seems to suggest these attackers created this malware a lot earlier than we previously uh, suspected. More importantly, it also shows some proof that advanced malware can sometimes live on an unsuspecting network for quite a long time. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I personally believe visibility is defense. It's great to have preventative security controls like what we offer in our UTM and content filtering appliances, but as security experts, we have to remember we can't just invest in preventative technologies. We should also invest in visibility tools which help us see what's happening on our network. Graphical visibility tools can often help us find infections on our network or other anomalies. Uh, the good news is Products like mine do have a lot of graphical real-time visibility monitors built in. So for the security and IT administrators out there, remember visibility tools are also important, so be sure to invest in them for your network security as well. The next big story this week is a major LinkedIn password leak. 
During the week, a Russian attacker posted a huge text file containing 6.5 million LinkedIn hashed passwords to a Russian uh, hacking website. No one knows exactly how the attacker got these supposed passwords, and the text file only contains the actual hash values, none of the usernames. But you have to suspect that the attacker has the usernames associated with these hashes as well. Uh, if I were to guess how they might have got them, I would suggest it was probably a secret injection attack as that's a common way that bad guys can pull data from the database backends of many of these online web applications like LinkedIn. Let's talk a little bit about how LinkedIn stored these passwords. I mentioned these were hashed passwords. In computing and cryptography, a hash function is a one-way mathematical algorithm that allows you to generate a very unique, specific-sized key for a data set, no matter how big or small that data set is. So in other words, it generates a key that allows you to verify whether or not a data set is really valid. It doesn't, by the way, encrypt that data set in any way. It just shows you whether this key really matches a particular specific data set. Now hashing password databases is good. If you store these passwords as hashes, it makes it so that if attacker steals your database, they don't actually have the clear text passwords yet. However, how you hash your password database is very, very important. In this case, LinkedIn seems to store its passwords as unsalted SHA-1 hashes. Now, this brings up another cryptographic term called SALT. Uh, without getting into a ton of technical detail, a SALT is a little bit of extra random data that you can mix in with a one-way algorithm to make it even that much harder for attackers to kind of uh, brute force or do a dictionary attack on your actual hash. Because LinkedIn didn't salt their hashes, it makes it quite easy for attackers to actually take those hashes and crack a bunch of them. Uh, for one, computing technology has gotten very, very fast. Uh, bad guys can use graphic cards or dri distributed computing to really increase uh, their brute forcing attacks. On top of that, bad guys have already generated big, big rainbow tables containing many, many SHA-1 hashes. So they can actually crack SHA-1 databases uh, from 1 to 8 characters very, very quickly. So in short, even though LinkedIn did hash their password database, I suspect that attackers will gain the actual clear text passwords for many of these if they haven't already. So what should you do if you're a LinkedIn user? Well, password security. Really, in this day and age where we do everything in the cloud, password security is paramount. First of all, if you use LinkedIn, change your password immediately if you haven't already. Hopefully you did so when I first mentioned this on WatchGuard Security Center. But in any case, change your LinkedIn password. More importantly, hopefully you're not using the same password on every website you go to. If you do, that means that attackers that get your LinkedIn password may have access to all your other accounts, mostly if they have your email address. If that's the case for you, you also need to go to those other accounts as well and change their password, and more importantly, make that password different. Do not use the same password at every different website on the internet. Of course, you should also practice strong password creation. I personally recommend using password sentences. Uh, this is uh, typing a short sentence as a password using capitalization, punctuation, and space is to make it a complex password. Finally, having different passwords for many different sites is sometimes hard to handle, so I really do recommend you look at Password Vault software out there. Uh, one I personally use is something called 1Password. I like it because it works on Windows, on Macs, and on my Android and iOS mobile devices. So consider using Password Vault software to manage all your different passwords. Whoa! What happened? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry about the random change in venue. I had to record this month's episode from the road to speak at another security event in Portland. Anyways, there's only a few more stories left, and they kind of pale in comparison to advanced malware like Flame and the big LinkedIn breach. Nonetheless, I have a few updates to share. The first is if you're a Firefox user, Mozilla did release Firefox 13, an, a new update. Uh, the update fixes a bunch of security flaws and does have some new security functionality as well, so Firefox users should go get it. 
Also on Thursday, Microsoft released their advanced patch notification for next Tuesday. Uh, according to this notification, they'll again release seven security bulletins. Three of the bulletins are critical. Uh, they affect things like Windows, Internet Explorer, Office, and a couple other uh, Microsoft-related packages, also .NET Framework. Uh, pretty standard Microsoft patch day. They've pretty much released the same amount of updates for the past few months, so it should be a typical patch day. If you're a Microsoft administrator, be sure to be ready to test and deploy these patches next Tuesday. Uh, you can check out WatchGuard Security Media Center for posts about all the updates. Well, that covers yet another busy and interesting week of information security news. I hope you found this episode educational. If you're looking for more regular security news, don't forget to follow our blog, WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com, and check out my tweets. I'm at SecAdept. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.